Newsmaker Sunday with Fox 10's John Hook. She just won the Republican primary for Arizona District 8. If you don't know District 8, it includes many of the suburbs north and west of Phoenix in Maricopa County. Really good year north to Peoria, all the way north to New River. It's a big district. President Trump carried this district 58% to 37% in 2016. To say that it is um, pretty solidly Republican would be an understatement. Debbie Lesko is our guest this week on Fox 10 Newsmaker Thank you Sunday. Thank for having me. Congratulations, Thank number you. one. And, um, you know, you win it in a crowded field. Yes. How many candidates did it end up? I mean, there were write ins. <laughs> there were, it seemed that there were about a dozen people in the mix, maybe You're more. Right. A dozen on the Republican side. So it was myself and 11 gentlemen. And quite frankly, some of the people that were running I had never even heard of before. They weren't very active at all in the Republican Party. I got to meet them throughout the campaign. Here's, so, uh, yeah, here you, you go. Know, Here's, here were the people. better known people. Yes, yes. Steve Montenegro, who yes. ran into his own difficulties um, uh, through, you know, uh, a sexting scandal. How much do you think that affected this race, Steve you Montenegro's? Know, issues it's hard for me to know I think from the early ballot results it looks like I would have won either way um, perhaps it affected who came in second and third place I think ultimately if I'm not mistaken um, Phil Lovis came in second place and not very far behind Steve Montenegro but I was fully out in front I think I had 36 percent of the votes and then I believe they were tied at about 24 percent right. each and so for having 12 candidates I, I think I did well um, to, let's let's go back over your history. You sure. served in the Arizona legislature from 2009 to 2015. You mm -hmm. were a state senator representing District 21 yes. after that. Tell me how you got into politics, first of all. I, a lot of people, you know, they know the name, yes. but they may not know much about yeah. you. Well, it all started out when I wanted to know who to vote for on the ballot. And, um, Give I me didn't, a year. What year? Oh, probably 20 years ago now. Wow. And so I was at a time of my life where... I was interested. Who are these people on the ballot? So I called the kids were older. Yeah. They were out of yeah. high school. I don't know if they were out of high school, but you know, anyway, the the I decided to call the state Republican Party because I'm a Republican. I believe in the Republican platform and its principles and asked them, "Do you have meetings?" And sure enough, they do in every single legislative district. There are Republican meetings each and every month. So I started going to the meetings, and Jan Brewer was there. I think she was a county supervisor at the time. Right, she was the yeah. chairman of the county yeah. board of supervisors. And, and I had uh, I met our elected state uh, officials, and I got really involved. Registered voters helped out at different events, and before you know it, I got elected as their district Republican chairman, which is a volunteer position, and then got elected as a Maricopa County Republican officer then a state uh, party Republican officer, all volunteer positions. And then in 2008, Bob Stump decided to move on and run for Corporation Commission. So there was an opening in the State House. Mm -hmm. People asked me to run. I said to my husband, should I run? He said, why not? You volunteer all the time anyway. And so, <laughs> for and no so, pay. <laughs> for no pay. Do you remember and the so, first yeah. time somebody said to you, Debbie, I think you should run for an office? Was it during that race or was it, was it earlier that than that oh, where well, somebody said? No, I ran for a school board in 2006. So I was very involved in my kids' schools. Uh, they went to Peoria Unified School District schools. And uh, I, was in, I was the, you know, uh, fundraising chairman uh, one year mm -hmm. and you know raised all kinds of dollars for the PTA right, right. and that yep. helped the school and so I got involved and I ran for that office I lost in 2006 and then I decided to run for the legislature in 2008 and now so, look 10 years later I know I never would have believed it to tell you the truth um, let's talk a little bit about yeah. your philosophy you if bet. there were one politician that you would say if people don't know you, right? But they, if you said this is kind of my beacon, this is a person I look to that really reflects where I am politically. Who would that be? John Kyle, without a doubt. No I, hesitation. I, yes, no. He is very honorable man, very common sense, hardworking, and people have told me I've gained a reputation for taking on big issues. 
I work hard, I take things seriously, I study the issues, and um, I've always respected John Kyle, and I, geez, I could only hope that I would be just a little bit of him. He, he's awesome. If you were elected to Congress, and we're going to have your, your opponent on, we're actually going to have her on today as part of this program, but they couldn't make the scheduling okay. work out. So we, we will make that happen. Um, here all, boy, Tipper Nenny, Tipper Nenny, is that correct? I think so. I met I'm her still for the first time it. last night. We yes, were there a, she is. Yeah, we were at a City of Glendale event. It was uh, Jerry Wires, Mayor Jerry Wires mm -hmm. was giving his State of the City, and I walked up to her. She was sitting at a different table and introduced myself and said, hi, uh, seems like a nice lady. So there will be some debates, and you guys sure. will talk about issues. I'm, yeah. I look forward to it. If you were to be elected, what would be the things that drive you that you would want to try to get accomplished in the, in the House of Representatives? Well, first and foremost, I like helping my constituents, and I have a reputation for doing that. I go to a lot of meetings, a lot of events. I really try to help my constituents, and I think that's very important. But beyond that, I really believe we need to secure the border. Um, this has been a problem way too long. It's a problem for our national security because we don't know who is crossing the border all the time and who is here. And I think government's number one responsibility is to protect its citizens, and part of that is securing the border. We're, we're looking right now at video from Oakland, California. The, these were the ICE raids that went on. I wanted to ask you a little bit about this because this mayor sure. in Oakland openly thwarted uh, an ICE operation and said, look, I owe it to my constituents who, many of whom are here illegally. I owe it to them to be uh, an advocate for them. They live in this community, and I wanted to protect them and give, give them a heads up. What did you make of this situation in Oakland when you watched it? Well, I, I totally uh, think that the laws should be followed, and certainly a mayor should be following the laws. And so I don't believe in sanctuary cities or anything like that, and I actually think sanctuary cities should be penalized. But, you know, people need to follow the law. We have lots of laws in place, and I was, um, you know, years ago, I was a co-sponsor of Senate Bill 1070 because we were so frustrated that the federal government wasn't enforcing the current immigration laws we had. Well, now we have a president, President Trump, that believes we need to enforce the law, and so I agree that we need to build a wall, we need to add border agents, um, we need to increase technology. Um, so that's one of the issues that I think my constituents think is important and I'd like to follow through when, with. When you yeah. say um, building a wall, mm -hmm. does that mean a physical barrier as mm -hmm. President Trump, he's even softened on it and said, look, it's going to be a combination of a lot of things. That's not what he said during the campaign. But mm -hmm. he's, as we know with President Trump, everything is an opening, it's an opening offer in a negotiation. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't take him yeah. literally on anything, because everything, I think, is the art of the deal. It's an opening negotiation, and then he works from there. I think that in some areas we need a physical wall or fence, whatever you want to call it. In other areas, it's not practical. So you probably need more technology. Um, I went down to the border a few times on a tour when I was in the state legislature, and they can do all these. They have a combination of drones. They have sensors in the ground. Right, right. Um, you know, it, it, it's a tough job. I, I do think they need more border agents. And so I think a combination of all of that, as long as we can know who is crossing the border, um, that that's the answer. We need a combination of everything. Let me, let me ask you about mm -hmm. E-Verify because as I've studied this issue over the years, one mm -hmm. of the things that strikes me is you could pretty much solve a lot of this with a true, yes, with teeth, mm -hmm. E-Verify. I then agree. If somebody comes here to work and they can't work, yeah. they're not going to come here. Yes, no, I totally agree with you. E-Verify is a farce, we need mandatory, the way it is right now. Yep, we need mandatory E-Verify, and you're absolutely right. If there's not an incentive for people to come here, they're not going to come here. Is that that hard to accomplish? Why can't we get E-Verify? With, <laughs> with E-Verify, to me, yeah. you might not even need a wall. I don't know why that's not been accomplished. I can only think it's some kind of political reason. Or because, economic reason yeah. for companies that want to skirt the yeah. law. Yeah, that's, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I would assume that it's 
easily accomplished, and I don't know why we haven't done it For yet. For people at home, E-Verify mm -hmm. basically links the person who is seeking the job with a, a Social Security number. The problem is there's no linkage between the Social Security number and that person in front of you applying for a job. Yeah. So it could be a real Social Security number, but it might belong to a dead person from years ago. This is a problem, and, no, and there's no cross-checking. Well, well, they need a picture to go along with it. I think. <laughs> that would be nice, <laughs> biometric. That would be nice. I'm sure we could accomplish it. But other things that I think are important to me and to my constituents are our, our, our national defense, and included in that is uh, Luke, Luke Air Force of course, Base. Yes. Luke Air Force Base is in Congressional District 8. It's very important to our national security. Is that your biggest employer in 8? Uh, I don't know if it's the biggest employer or if the, the government is. Maybe the school system might be. I'm not sure. But I know that it's a huge economic engine in our uh, part mm -hmm. of the valley and the entire state. And so it's very important that we protect Luke Air Force Base. I mean, years ago, uh, I think prior to me being in the state legislature, I went down. Remember when there was a El Mirage was against the F-35s? Yes, I was I, ask I you went about the F down there and I testified in front of some uh, folks back then in support of the F-35. And so it, I'm so glad that we protected Luke Air Force Base and we need to continue to do that. You're a fiscal hawk, fair, fair yeah, to say? Okay. It is fair to Given say. Given that, do you think the F-35 is the, is the way to go in the future, not just because it's at Luke, but because it's the best aircraft out there? Because my concern is we're asking one airplane to do a lot of stuff. You know, I'm not an expert at that, so I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, if it's the best airplane forever, um, certainly technology will change, but I'm glad that Luke Air Force Base got the F-35s. We kept Luke Air Force mm -hmm. Base, and it's so important to our nation, and it's so important to Arizona and the West Valley. So that's a key issue. Of course, another issue is the economy. I agreed with President Trump's and the Congress's tax cuts, um, but I'm also concerned about our debt. And so we really need to start balancing our budget or at least getting to that point where we need to cut spending. That's the only way around it. If you're going to cut taxes, you need to cut wasteful spending. Now, when we get into spending, 65% mm -hmm. um, of the budget, the federal budget, I know you're yeah. aware of this, is Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Yeah. To try to get into there and make changes in those programs is the third rail. Yeah, it's very tough, you know, but... We need to protect Social Security and Medicare for the people that depend on it now. Now, we might be able to reform some things for the new people coming in at some point. And I did that in pension reform. So when I became a freshman, this was in 2008. Uh, well, actually, I got sworn in you know, in we've 2009. Got video. The, I, let me stop yeah. you because we've got video okay. of pension reform. All this right. is something you led the charge on. I did. You said that officers should start collecting at 55 instead of 52 and a half. Raise it by two and a half years. But that all of a sudden makes the tables balance. Yeah, that was just part of it. We had, so what happened is I was a freshman. I got put on the retirement committee. I knew nothing about public pensions. Nobody in my family had worked for the government. But I realized that this was a problem. It was unsustainable. It's a problem across the country. It was unsustainable. And cities started coming to us at the legislature saying, we can't afford to hire new firefighters and police. The pensions are just outrageously costly. Yet they need new people yes. to feed into the pension. Exactly. So that exactly. it's... So when I got more experience, so I was over in the Senate at the time, and Senate Finance Chairman would dealt with tax policy and pension policy, I asked Andy Biggs specifically if I could be assigned to that committee as chairman because I wanted to try to fix the pension systems. So I took on the hardest one first, politically, and that was the fire and police pension system because politically that one was the hardest, and I took a year and a half of negotiations with the unions, the cities, conservatives, uh, Democrats. And after a year and a half, we came up with a consensus. And it passed out of the legislature, got signed into law, and a portion of it went on the ballot. And the voters voted for it, 70% approval. It saved a half a billion dollars to the state of Arizona. 
and save the plan. And that's the type of thing you can do. You have to protect the plan and Medicare and Medicaid for the people this. that have been promised. But you can start changing things just a little bit going forward like I did with the pension plan and you can really save the system. Right. Uh, and, uh, and Social so, Security is a prime yeah. example. Yeah. I mean if nobody was expecting, my father's 94, mm -hmm. bless him, but he's been collecting now for a long time. Now he paid in right. for years and sure. years. But nobody expected there would be these people around who were living toward 100 and beyond collecting Social Security. Yeah. They actually planned when they built the system that most people were going to die before they ever collected. So of course it was flush with cash. It's all changed, so why not with new workers say, you know what, you're going to have to work a couple more years longer before you collect. Is that a crazy idea? No, it's not a crazy idea, and I don't know what ultimately we can do. I just know it needs to be done. And since I have a history of tackling big issues, I mean, that's why I served in the legislature. I was self-employed before that. I could have been doing anything and just volunteering. What were you doing, but just quickly? That, oh, I was self-employed in sales. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I was making decent money, not like huge amounts of money. But I really was attracted to trying to make a difference, whether it was in my kids' schools or for a while I served on um, in a city of Glendale community enrichment uh, board, that type of thing, master plan community. So you've been involved. I just like being involved. I like making a difference. And I really do believe every single person makes a difference in their own way. At the legislature, you can make a difference in a broader way. You can change laws. And so, for instance, uh, I take on big issues like pension reform, tax reform, but I also do things to directly benefit my constituents when I was in the legislature. For instance, Sun City was part of my district, is part of my district, and all of a sudden, after years, the sheriff's department starts giving golf carts tickets for driving on this. the right side of I the road. I remember this. I remember it this. It became a huge issue. They were giving tickets and for something that they had done since 1960. Right. That's and, just the way. And, that's a lifestyle out right. there. Right. And so I got involved. I met with the different stakeholders, the sheriff's department, the Department you of Transportation. You had to deal with Arpaio? Uh, yeah, Did well, you tell his, him, hey, back it off out in Sun City? <laughs> yeah, it was. I, I'm surprised. I don't even know if he realized what was going on, you know, that they were giving tickets at the time because Sun City is his base, you know. Right. And so, in any case, um, we got it fixed. We had a golf cart parade <laughs> out in Sun City. <laughs> governor Brewer was the governor at the time, right. and she was in the, you know, part of the parade celebration. And then... Um, when I got surprise as part of my district in this last redistricting, somebody called me up and said, hey, we need to get rid of this photo radar camera on Grand Avenue in El Mirage, right? And so it took me like <laughs> Don't five get me years. On photo radar. I think it took me five years, but I finally passed a law to get rid of photo radar cameras on state highways. It's illegal now. Because cities were putting them on state highways, the one up in Star Valley. Did you Valley. think that that was strictly a money-making scam? Yes. Yes. Interesting. We're back with uh, <laughs> Debbie Lesko, who just won the primary for District 8, Republican. This is who replaces Trent Franks, as you know, who resigned in December. Back in a minute with Debbie Lesko. Back with Debbie Lesko. She's a former state senator for the uh, state of Arizona out of District 21, and she started that position in 2015. Before that, House of Representatives from 2009 to 2015. And in case you're wondering, District 8 is really suburbs north and west of Phoenix, runs from Goodyear to the south to Peoria, a little bit north northward, and then all the way up to New River. Yeah. Let me ask you about this, um, these complaints. Yeah. Uh, this legal complaint, a transfer of $50,000 in state funds mm -hmm. to a PAC mm -hmm. that ended up then going back to you. And a couple people cried foul. Phil Lovis, who was one of right. your opponents in, in CD8, who lost. Uh, that complaint was dismissed by the Secretary right. of State. But you still have um, this campaign legal center, a Washington-based yeah. group, that is on board with a FEC, Federal Elections Commission, mm -hmm. a question. Right. What happened there? Well, everything that we did, I have probably the best election attorney works for my campaign. And everything that we did is totally legal. Why did you do it? Was you there know, a reason? Well, because you have money in your state 
you know, your state account. And I'm a person that believes in the Republican Party, wants to help Republican candidates. So if we can use some of that money to help Republican candidates, why not? Otherwise, it just sits there. You know, you can't use it for anything, basically. So it wasn't just funneled to your campaign back from the PAC. It was, it was put into a political action committee whose purpose was to help conservatives. Other, other conservatives. Yes. And so basically, there is nothing wrong with what I did. My attorneys blessed it. Everything is totally legal. Um, Phil Lovis, who is one of my opponents, um, filed a complaint. I can only assume he did it, you know, to try to win the election. But now I have to deal with it. And now this other group, I've been told by my attorney, they habitually file complaints the against campaign Republicans. Legal Center. Yeah, the, the, but they are a Republican yeah. group because the center is headed by this guy Trevor Potter, who's a Republican yeah. who was appointed by George W. Bush. I know nothing about this group. All I can do is tell you what my attorneys say: is they habitually go after Republicans. So even if this guy is a Republican, he must not be a conservative Republican. <laughs> I don't know him at all. But you're not worried about it. No, because everything we did is totally legal, and my lawyers will take care of all this. And, you okay. know, we did nothing wrong. Let's, let's roll tape number seven. You bet. Uh, Donald Trump has talked a lot about the school shooting situation. Right. Do you believe that we should be tinkering with what arms people should or can and are allowed to buy? You know, I don't think we need any more laws to regulate law-abiding citizens. I, I just don't believe in that. I do think we need to protect our schools. Now, this is very complicated. Obviously, we need to help people that have some type of emotional problem, whether it be mental illness or mm -hmm. suicidal or whatever it is. In this case, in Florida, there was a lot of signs that this there were from the this FBI young, to local yeah, authorities. that this young man was really had some issues, mental issues. But it's really complicated. You know, when I was in the state legislature, the constables came to me and they wanted some legislation to help them get the guns from people that had a restraining order against them for domestic right, violence. Right. And I thought, yeah, hey, let's try to work on that because they're, they're not allowed to have uh, guns, right? But I soon realized it was extremely complicated because you don't want to take away people's rights. I mean, you just it's don't want Second somebody. Amendment right. Well, that Second Amendment, but also you don't want a family member who's mad at someone just saying, oh, they're mentally ill, let's take away their gun rights. Yeah. I mean, it's very complicated, but we need to try to find some solutions for people that have mental illness, suicidal tend tendencies. You know, it's really a problem. We've got to take a break. Back sure. final thoughts with Debbie Lesko, uh, Congressional District 8, the Republican nominee. And that election's coming up shortly. We're back in a minute on Newsmaker Sunday. Final moments on Newsmaker Sunday with Debbie Lesko, who just won the uh, CD8, Congressional District 8 primary on yes. Tuesday night. And you've got a general election to yes. fulfill the remainder of Trent Frank's yes. term in April. Yes, so April it's coming 24th. Up. And the early ballots go out on March 28th. So in less than a month, I have another... Uh, election to convince voters to vote for me. And I, I really love my constituents. A big part of my District 21 was Sun City. I also know the folks in Sun City West. I've been part of the Republican mm -hmm. Women Club for years. And, so you're uh, a known quantity out there. Yeah. Let, let me roll tape number six. This is sure. Trent Franks. Um, I think he was a Steve Montenegro guy because Montenegro yes. worked for him. Do you want his endorsement or would you rather just let it go? You know, I, I don't think that I will ask for his endorsement. I mean, he's, I've always respected Trent Franks, um, but Were you surprised forward, with what happened? I was surprised. I was, I was very surprised. So this just kind mm -hmm. of was foisted upon you. Yes, this wasn't in my plans, but, you know, I took about a week and a half after Trent resigned to think this through to see if I wanted seconds. to do it. And ultimately, a door opened, and I decided to walk through it. Debbie Lesko, good to see you, and um, appreciate your time. And Thank we will you. we will be chatting in the future, I'm All sure. All right, good. And um, Debbie Lesko's opponent will be on this program, I believe, next week on Newsmaker Sunday. We'll see you next week on Newsmaker Sunday. Thank you.